Let's talk about our most commonly used storage policy, which is our RAID 1 policy. Our RAID 1 policy can support anywhere from one failure all the way up to three failures in the environment. We abbreviate that as FTT, our failures to tolerate. How many failures are we willing to tolerate? And as we start increasing our FTT, there's hardware considerations and there's storage considerations that come along with it. But as we start talking about them, we'll dive into what that looks like. One more acronym I want to introduce before we jump into it is FTM. So we've got FTT, which is how many failures. FTM is our failure tolerance method. How do we put the data in your environment? Our RAID 1 policy is a mirroring policy. So you have data in multiple locations. We also have something called erasure coding, which is our striping policy. So think of RAID 5 or RAID 6, where we stripe the data in the environment. We'll talk about RAID 5 and RAID 6 in an upcoming video. Okay, now that we've talked about all the acronyms, let's talk about our RAID 1 FTT of 1 policy first. Let's say we have our data stored in warehouse 1. Well, that's our only copy of the data. And if something were to happen to that warehouse, whether that's fire, theft, flood, or something else, we would lose access to that data. We would have to reproduce it. And that's kind of like our RAID 0 policy, where our RAID 1 policy says, let's mirror that in multiple locations, let's have two copies. And for translating that into vSAN, that would be we have a copy on host 1 and a copy on host 2. We're going to do a much deeper dive in a future video about how we place the data. But for right now, we'll just say there's data on host 1 and there's data on host 2. But let's say we have some kind of network partition happens. Administrator comes in, logs into our switch, and just mistypes something. Well, now we've got a situation where host 1 can't communicate with host 2. They both have healthy copies of the data, but where should the VM be running? Should it be running on host 1 or should it be running on host 2? The way vSAN addresses it is vSAN is a quorum-based system. We have a tiebreaker in the environment, and that's our witness component. We've got data components and we've got witness components. When we usually talk about vSAN components, a data component, we just typically call a component, and a witness component, we just typically call a witness. But they're all components at the end of the day. And so we've got a witness component is acting as a tiebreaker. So let's say we've got host 1 host 2 that are split, but I've got host 3, which has our witness component. Well, now we've got, you can think of like votes, for an example. We've got one vote here and two votes here. Well, because we have two votes, this is where our VM should be running because it has more votes. With vSAN, we have to have more than 50% of our components available at any point in time. Whether that's data or witness, more than 50%. Not at 50%, and this will be important for our RAID 5, RAID 6 video, but it has to be greater than 50%. So in the case of our single host, well, it's at 33%. On the other side, we've got our two hosts with our one data component and our one witness component, we're at 66%. So this says this is where our VM should run. You may be thinking, what happens if I have a situation where I lose the witness, is that okay? So I've got component one and component two. And that's completely fine because we're above that 50% watermark. We can still continue running our VMs. We still have access to our data. Let's take that scenario one step further. Let's say I lose component one and I lose our witness. We have what we call a double fault. We've suffered more failures than we're designed to tolerate because our RAID 1 FTT of one policy says, I'm designed to tolerate one failure. We have two and we have three, but right now we've only configured it for one failure in the environment. And in that situation, our best course of action would be, could we bring host one back online or host three back online? Whatever gets above that 50% watermark. Because once we get above it, we have access to our data. And if for some reason we can't do that, reach out to support and ask them for some additional assistance. They have a few levers they can pull to hopefully bring that data back online. Let's talk about our storage usage next. I've got data component number one, data component number two means I have two copies of the data. If that was a 100 gig VMDK, I'd be using up 200 gigs worth of storage. The witness component itself, it's only a few megs in size, so we usually don't consider it when we're calculating how much storage we're using. And I think that lays enough of the framework to allow us to start talking about RAID 1 FTT of 2. With our RAID 1 FTT of 2 policy, we're increasing the amount of data components we have and the amount of witness components we have to support those additional failures. Our formula is 2n plus 1. So two times the number of failures we want to tolerate plus one. So two times two plus one would be five. We need to have five components. If our RAID 1 FTT of one policy has two data components, we're bringing up to three data components. And with our RAID 1 FTT of two policy, we're also having two witnesses compared to one witness with our FTT of one policy. And so that comes out to, we need to have five components. Well, if one component goes on each host, 
I need to have a minimum of five ESXi hosts. And then again, kind of go back to what we just calculated the storage. If I need to have three data components, that would be 300 gigs for a 100 gig BMDK. And for our witness, again, they're just a few megs in size, really tiny. We just don't really calculate them in our storage requirements. And for this policy, I could lose both our witnesses because I still have greater than 50% of our components available. But as long as we're above 50%, we still have access to it. Taking that one step further, talking about our FTT of three policy, our RAID 1 FTT of three. We need to increase our components again. Do we have four data components and three witness components? From a storage perspective, with that 100 gig VMDK, we'd be using 400 gigs worth of storage. But that would allow us to tolerate three failures in the environment. Our RAID 1 policy mirrors the data in the environment. Maybe thinking, why are you bringing that up? We've been talking about that. But I want to talk about it from a right perspective. We've got our VM up here. Let's say we're using RAID 1, FTT of 1 on our VMDK. Every time our VM wants to write a piece of data, it has to write to both components simultaneously. If for some reason I'm having an issue with one of our components, well, however long it takes to get that component to acknowledge that write, that's how long that'll take. So our VM says, I want to write a piece of data. It pushes it down to our two components. If this one takes five milliseconds and this one takes one millisecond, well, that write still took five milliseconds overall because we're still waiting for this component to come back and saying, yes, I acknowledge that right. And so that's just something to keep in mind as, as we increase our failures to tolerate, we're adding additional storage requirements, host requirements, and write requirements, because now we're having to write that data in multiple locations. Since we're talking about writes, let's briefly touch on reads. If our VM is on the same node as one of our data components, we'll just access that locally. But if we're using a RAID 1 FTT of 1 policy, if that VM is on one of the nodes that has its witness component, we'll just reach across the network and access that data. And this is where a little bit of confusion happens in the environment when we start getting to troubleshooting, because we may be having an issue with host one. And we say, well, you know what? I'm gonna move this VM off this host to another host. We may move that VM from the host that has a data component to one that has a witness component. So even though the VM is physically running the compute side, is running on a different host, it may be still accessing that data from that host that's having some kind of impacted state. So just something to keep in mind when it comes to reads, it's just because where the VM is running doesn't mean that's where the data is actually being accessed. Our last topic for this video will be data placement. We're just going to do a light brushing of the surface about this. We'll do a much deeper dive in a future video. Let's say I've got five 100 gig VMDKs. And throughout this video, I've been saying, oh, data component one on host one, data component two on host two, and the witness on host three. Well, in the case of our five 100 gig VMDKs, that means we'd be taking up 500 gigs on host one, 500 gigs on host two, and almost nothing on host three. And then from my ops perspective, all of our ops would be going host one and host two. Again, nothing much happening on host three. And that's not a really good utilization of our resources. So instead, every time we create a new object, with like a VMDK object, a namespace object, a swap object, VCN looks out there and says, where can I best place this environment to maximize my resources? And that's usually from a storage perspective. We can say, oh, this one has more storage than that one. Maybe it can mix and match things to better place them in the environment. I think that's a good place to stop this video. I feel like we've talked about a lot of things. So let's wrap up this video. We start off by talking about our failures to tolerate, our FTT. How RAID 1 supports an FTT of 1, 2, and 3. We then switch gears and talked about writes. How writes work in a mirroring environment. How we write to all of our components simultaneously. We then finish up by talking about reads. How we read data from a local component if our VM is on that same host or how we read across the network. I hope you found this video informative. I'd like to thank you for watching.